there he is showing off with all his beautiful memorabilia. I, I love it. It's not showing off if it's just part of your life. This is my life 24-7. It's just <laughs> <laughs> Eat, sleep, and drink Boston Celtics. Mark, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Just curious. I always love when, if you're listening to the other folks, yeah. what's your takeaway from Steve? You got to hear in there. What, what did he say that piqued your interest, both of you? I, look, I think Steve is, uh, is just, he's a fun guy to listen to. That's, he's just, he's, he really believes in it, in all of this. He's going to go out of his way to make sure that it works. So you want owners like that. I think you guys hit it on the head. Um, I just love listening to him and his enthusiasm. Absolutely. And when he said he's retired, I'm like, he's, <laughs> he's, 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 it, it just means he's got 10 televisions at once and they're all basketball. They're not five of them. You know, I mean, he's, he's going nonstop. But when I came in in oh, late 02, oh, uh, early 03 into this league, a lot of the teams were owned by just family owners and great people who had been very successful, but they'd owned them for many decades. But now it's all like Mark and Wes in the box. And it's like, like my group here in Boston. Um, a lot of people that just really only care about the basketball and it's just a totally different league and it's made it a lot more competitive. You got 30 teams trying to rip your head off every single night, 29 other teams. So and when it, Mark uh, and Wes came like, in, it's it was like, right before Steve did, and then the valuations took off um, from 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 the Steve's purchase onwards uh, into into a new stratosphere. And um, one of the reasons, which we really highlight in our valuations, what makes ours a little bit um, different from others that are out there and unique, is that we talk about related businesses. We we're talking with Adam a little bit about this earlier. Um, teams leveraging basketball to get into new areas that are part of the fabric of, of the broader picture. And so with that in mind, Mark, the Bucks were responsible for maybe my favorite kind of uh, niche sports business story of the last year, the Cream City Cluckery. Can you tell our, uh, our guests what, what the, the chicken restaurant is and how it came to be? Oh, I think, I, I think when we set it up, um, you know, Peter Fagan, who's our president, came up with that idea. Um, and really, it was us, you know, deciding we're going to create, um, you know, a, a new restaurant. And we thought that we could build something that was going to be unique. And that if it actually took off in Milwaukee, um, that we could actually try to go national. And it's actually taking off and it's doing great. And now we're trying to see if we can open up more restaurants. Um, so it's a little bit of what you said. It's really sort of taking a concept and seeing that if you can get fans behind it and people behind it, it's actually a really good product um, that can you end up taking it around, you know, I, I would say then Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and the rest of the country, Um Right now, it looks like it's got some legs, and I hope it'll keep on growing. Well, it also has thighs and other things. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, I I had to do it. I'm sorry. I know there's a thousand groans all over, but I had to do it. Me and my dad jokes for two. Wick, let me let me ask you this: Is there a bit of envy that you are listening to Steve Ballmer talking about creating this new basketball paradise that he will control, Mark and Wes? And Jamie and the Bucks created this basketball paradise that they control. The Celtics do not control their own building. That limitation of what you can do, is it at all frustrating? Well, if you ever had a year to not control your own building, it's this year. <laughs> good point. Good point. That's not meant to be a snotty, crummy right. remark at all. It's meant to be an honest answer. But we have thrived over the 18 years because we built a partnership with the Jacobs family that owns the Bruins in the garden. And it's a real partnership. And we've just renewed uh, the lease, as a matter of fact, a month ago. But it's a um, it's so centrally located in Boston, uh, basically all of Boston, which is a small town, can walk to the game. Um, you know, any, anybody working downtown can easily get to the game. Uh, the garden is we've had 150 million plus put into it and being more coming. And it's right where we want to be. If the trains come in, the subways come in. The highways come in and people can walk there. So this is where we're going to stay. 
um, in partnership with the Bruins and the Jacobs family. So we're perfectly happy and we don't control it. I'd be happy to co-control it with them someday or do something like that, but we're not, um, I, I have a lot of envy for people like Mark and Wes, the way their team plays uh, and, and <laughs> Steve from time to time, but uh, we have to fix that on the court. I'm wondering in terms of having two owners with us at once and also specifically with the example, which, which I'll, I'll say in a minute of Mark's business partner, Wes, this idea of establishing cooperative multi-team initiatives. So Wes, Jeannie Bust, Michael Jordan, they're all involved in the tequila business together. What, what um, possibilities? Might and, be way, and, and Rick is involved too. Peter, my oh, wife. So even, even better. Even better. Peter. Peter, Peter. Yeah. Google Sincoro. Okay, my wife's the CEO. All the rest okay. of us report to her. Well, now we're giving it so much airtime. I feel like I feel like I, I should be sent a bottle or two. Um, <laughs> so, we're sold so, out. We're doing two hundred thousand cases this year in our second full year. It's absolutely. Let, let it's me ask you, wait. You mentioned it. It's killing it. Wait, 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 is that because of the notoriety of the owners involved? I mean, obviously it didn't help. You got a lot of press, but the ability, the promotional uh, ability to bring these brands, and when I say that, I mean the teams and yourselves behind one product. It's been it's been great. It's authentic because we all, Michael Jordan introduced the rest of us to really the highest end tequila, and then we all decided to make our own. And Michael said, I just want to make it for ourselves. And we're like, okay, Michael, we're gonna have like a garage full of tequila, but then it was really good. And so we took it broader, but having Michael on board, uh, no no shade on Jeannie or Wes, but, or, or whatever, but uh, having Michael on board means people will try the first sip, but 200,000 cases in is people loving it. And uh, that's, there's a difference, but it, it, it's unbelievable to be in partnership with these guys. Can we broaden that out into if we're not, I mean, remember what we're talking about here, franchise valuations. Can we in some way broaden that out into exclusivity in pouring rights into multiple arenas? We're working on it. We're already the official tequila of the Lakers, but my guys here at the Celtics are a little tougher with their, uh, you know, pricing standards. I've got a bunch of limited partners here and I don't want them to feel like I'm taking advantage. So, uh, uh, but anyway, we're, we're, uh, we're working on it. It's, Someday, the way tequila is going, someday this might be like a franchise valuation. Well, let's talk about the, the bunch of your limited partners, because there was a transaction this past summer, um, which did not have much of a discount for lack of um, control compared to what our valuations say the team is worth at nearly $3.2 billion. And it had virtually no discount that we could discern based on COVID. Um, do you think that going forward, um, the effects of COVID, or I'll, I'll phrase it this way, earlier in the, in the program, Adam was saying that, that um, he thinks that in, in, in the grand scheme of things, COVID will, I'm paraphrasing, will not have an effect on valuation. Your LP deal says so far that that's probably true to a large extent. Do you think that that's the case going forward? Well, I think that we will, uh, I hope that uh, despite the tragedy of COVID and the millions of, what, however many millions of deaths there have been, I think two million, I don't know, a lot. Um, uh, I think we'll get past it with that caveat that we haven't all gotten past it. Um, I think that the long-term view, my view of these valuations, um, and I'm glad that you guys are jumping into it, First of all, we had a yeah, we had a minority transaction that was pretty close to three billion, two point eight something, I think. Uh, I don't know where that means the top line is for the Celtics if I put it on the market and let people bid for six or twelve months, but I'm not doing that. It's not for sale under any circumstances. Um, but I'm grateful that my partner stepped up and bought another partner out. And uh, but we take a, like a twenty year view around here, and we're just trying to win banners, and so. 20 year views would mean that any couple of years is going to be, uh, you know, the thrill, as Mark can tell you, the thrill of being a governor and the pain and heartbreak and agony of losing a game. I mean, in light of COVID, you can't say pain and heartbreak and agony about losing a game, but you can say the sad feeling of losing a game and the thrill of winning a game, a key game, is indescribable and it adds something to life that people don't otherwise get. And so the values here are real and they're beyond cash flow. Yeah, Mark, to that end, I will get to, I want to ask you about sort of the private equity infusion that may be hitting the NBA soon. 
But for what Wick just said, I'm curious, would it be a successful season if you won a championship but lost, I don't know, let's just throw in $50 million? Is that a successful season? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it really is about the banner. There's that emotional attachment. You just need to win. The most money we ever lost was in 2008. And part of it was paying for the championship rings. I mean, come on. It's just, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. It's so much fun if you manage to win this thing. And everybody that I know that's in the league is all about that. And then about doing things in the community and well down into third place is how did you do at the bank? And, and I'm not made of money. I'm probably the least wealthy NBA owner of all of them but I'm maybe the happiest. I, I think the way to look at it, I mean, Wick's absolutely correct. Um, why are people paying luxury tax? Right? It's the, the ultimately at the end of the day, the goal is to win a championship. I mean, and if, if that's, I would tell you the vast majority of everybody is just trying to do that. And, you know, people pay luxury tax. Look at what the Nets, I think the Nets, by taking Harden on, um, you know, they're going to be paying luxury tax for the next, you know, four or five years. <clears throat> we're going to pay, you know, we're going to be paying luxury tax, same thing for the next four or five years. And the reason everybody does that is because you want to win. Um, it's, if you didn't want to win, you wouldn't be doing this. I mean, it's, um, these franchises do not really make money. Um, what it is is sort of the ability um, to try to compete every day. I think when you said the words Nets taking players on, Wick had a little Mona Lisa smile. He went back to Garnett and Pierce. But I, I'll say it, Wick. I won't make you do it. Um, Mark, how do you view what Peter and I talked to the commissioner about earlier, this seemingly uh, what's coming, the infusion of private equity capital into the NBA, inserting liquidity in the market? What do you see is, is pushing it and how do you think teams will respond and would be uh, would be investors? Look, I think at the end of the day, the NBA is becoming, if it isn't, it's becoming the, one of the most popular franchise. I mean, one of the most popular um, leagues out there. And because of that, everybody wants to become a part of it. And people want to invest in it. So whether it's private equity, however it'll be, um, you're going to have more and more capital that comes in. I think, I think in the beginning, it's a little bit of what Wick said. I think when he got started, it was much more family oriented businesses. And just as the value of these franchises goes up, um, you're going to end up seeing it more institutional investors. I mean, you know, sports is the only thing you can't record. Like you, you can't go record and go watch it three days later. Um, you, you want to see it live. You want to be part of that experience. And as, as everybody is trying to figure out what to do, um, it's going to be one of these unique assets that, in my opinion, uh, the value is going to continue to grow over time. Is there tension in what we just heard, though? Both of you agree that you're in it to win it. Numbers be damned. Private equity investors are not in it to win it, I don't think. Yes, they'll probably get a ring no, negotiated as part of their investment. They're in it to make money. Is there a tension there that makes this untenable? No, because, Scott, I think, well, my answer would be uh, that what those guys are betting, what those people are betting on over an eight-year, ten-year holding period is that there will be another mega billionaire who's going to have the urge to win and to be the person who takes the trophy from the commissioner on the world stage and holds it over his or her head. And that's kind of what we're selling here when we sell control of these teams. Right. And so, and, and, and so betting on that, you know, that's why these teams used to be $3 million and then $10 million and $200 million. And now they're higher. Um, and if that persists, it's because of the control owners out there in the future who want to be the person who takes the trophy and says they're a world champion. That's the driving the value of these 30 pieces of art that we have hanging on the wall. They don't need to produce cash flow to be valuable. I, I would add one thing. I think, you know, um, I don't know when Lakeham bought the Warriors. I think it was 10 years ago, right? He sold out of the Celtics to do it. Okay, so how long was that? 10 years ago? It was 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So if you think about it, 10 years ago, I think he paid, I don't know, 350, 400 million. Um, 
So why are you guys valuing the team today at five plus billion, right? And and the reason is because the value of the franchise has gone up because they've won. And when you end up getting to the NBA finals and winning as many championships as they've done, the value of that franchise has gone up dramatically. And sort of winning ends up increasing the value. So I think for private equity or for everybody, everybody's on the same page that value creation is made by winning. But that's just that's just the way it is. So I think we all see that. Um you know, and the more you win, the higher the value of your franchise. But you also have opportunity. Peter, you you talked about them in your valuations, uh, the opportunity internationally. Yeah. Whether you have a Giannis or not, um, I, I'm, I'm curious as to both of you guys look at the international opportunities from where we are now and then the ability to scale with sort of this digital revolution in media that's coming. I think that's what, look, Internationally, I think uh, the growth that's going to come out of Europe, out of Asia, out of China. I mean, we're just tapping into that. So I, I think we are probably five, ten years behind uh, in soccer. We sort of look at how, you know, that's become one of the most or if not the most popular sport. Um, and that's international. Um, I think the NBA is going down that road. And as you tap into that having a player like Giannis is going to help. But ultimately what will end up, it's really the, it, it, it's the franchise, it's the NBA. That's what's becoming popular. And yes, you're going to have specific teams that may be more popular, but the benefit is going to inure to all 30 teams. Uh, curious, you're, you're, you're in the risk analysis business, Mark. What are the risk factors you see out there, if any? Uh, and you too, Wick. There's always risks. I mean, I think there's always risks. Um, I, I think part of it is just how well do we manage our product? And is it a product that people are always going to want to see? And I, I think right now um, it is and it has been. Um, and I think part of that is, you know, Adam has done an absolutely fa phenomenal job. Um, you know, owners like Wick, who are on a whole bunch of these committees, have done a great job. It's I think it's keeping the product um, at the high levels that people want to be. Um, as long as we do that, we'll be fine. And I think it's keeping uh, on telling the stories of the players and enabling our players, partnering with the players in every possible way, but including getting their stories out because people get interested in your roster who may or may not be particularly interested in basketball. I mean, we had Shaquille O'Neal come to the Celtics for a year and he took Boston over. He posed like a statue on Har in Harvard Yard and, you know, and, and our ratings went from, you know, 3.2 locally to 11. We we're outrating everybody. We we're outrating every TV show, you know, just for like preseason games because Shaq was so interesting to everybody. And so when I came here, I don't think people could name more than two or three Celtics players. And now we make sure sort of most of Boston can name like eight guys on the team, if not more. And, and getting to know the players and knowing what an amazing guy, for example, Giannis is, or Kemba, or Jason Tatum. I mean, people are fascinated with our players and they see them up close and personal. They're literally larger than life. Um, and we're up close and they're not wearing helmets or face masks. Um, when they're playing and you know you can get to know the nba players and that's why it it goes global and it will go continue to be global yeah i like to uh, combine two of scott's questions both about the private equity and the lp stakes and your um risk assessment so you're both from um an investment background private equity hedge funds um and assess risk and which prompted scott to ask his question but when we were Speaking with with Adam, he was telling us a lot of the positives of the idea of, of opening up LP investments to um, institutional investors and beginning with these um, highly focused private equity uh, funds, one of which has been approved so far. I'm wondering, what's the other side of the coin on that? What are the ways in which that could have a negative impact on franchise valuation going forward, if, if you can think of it? 
it's hard it's hard to have a negative impact but i would tell you the only one is if someone turned out to be a bad partner i think that's your risk everywhere you know ultimately in everything we're doing um what you want you know the success of the league is because you have 30 people all trying to do you know what's right you would have an issue if out of the 30 maybe one person goes off on a different direction and i i think your risk is always people so i think we're always very very focused on that um so you know i i, I don't think it's a large risk but that that is probably a risk and there's all sorts of stuff written into documentation of all this that people can be forced to sell stakes and you know they have to comply and they don't have access to this or that and so there's uh, checks and balances in there but no concern about investing in a in a in, in at that type of scale in multiple teams like if from the hockey world for example bell canada has a 37 and a half percent stake in the maple leafs and 18 percent stake in the canadians obviously bitter rivals but that's never posed an issue. If in this private equity world um, of investment in, in basketball team minority stakes and, and there are investments across a swath of teams, that doesn't strike you as, as an issue either? It's an issue to define minority or non-control in a way that makes everybody comfortable with that very real issue that you mentioned. Are you both still bullish on China or as much as I've been hearing about China for the last decade? We see games still not broadcast there. It's a very fickle business relationship to invest as much as the league has and will continue to, and poof, we won't show your games. So I think we are back on there um, for the most part, and or coming back, I believe. I think that was what I was told the other day. Um, but it's, uh, it's a, I think it's a long relationship and a long process, and probably don't have anything else to comment on that. I would agree with Wick. So going back to Steve and, and his extreme passion for the fan experience, uh, I'm wondering, um, obviously, obviously, Mark Scott alluded to, um, to your facility in, in Milwaukee and all the things that you've done to, to build that from the ground up. But I'm wondering what both of you um, have in store in terms of maybe not at the scale Steve was talking about, but in terms of future modifications once fans are actually allowed back into the arenas, not from a COVID standpoint, but in terms of say things are kind of back to normal as they can be from enhancing a fan experience standpoint. I, I, I don't mean to simplify it, but the greatest fan experience is when, I mean, that's, that's really it. it, it if you're winning, fans are thrilled, right? And then you can focus on adding things. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's really about winning. That if you're winning, uh, oh, I think Wick, you might have to so, just thought that. Sorry, right? I don't know if I lost you guys. Um, you're back. Things just end up being a lot easier if you're winning. Yeah, I like Mark, Mark, Mark's back, but I'm surprised it didn't come back and his name wasn't changed to Mark Lazary Steinbrenner because winning, I understand, is the creed for, for, for some ownership groups. So that's that, that's good to know. Wick, you were going to opine about that? Yes, opine, pontificate, whatever the verb is. Um, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm absolutely with Mark on this one. We're kind of old school over here. And, um, you know, Boston's a town where anybody walking down the street is going to cheer for all four pro teams or all five if you if they include the revolution but you know it's it it really crosses over you're just a boston fan and um it's really the sort of experience here and they want to get up and close up and close and personal we have their kids down on the court giving high fives to the players you know sadly that's not happening with COVID, of course but we're trying to get our season ticket holders enmeshed in the team and um out with us in the community and it's sort of the old school stuff around here uh and trying to win the game when i met with red auerbach when i came in he said look i'm glad you're here um i'm gonna try to make this work for you but just one thing no i think music. i lost you guys no music you're back we, i'm we sorry have you. i'm, I'm gonna got you, Mark. try to dial back you. in for some reason i'm having an issue so red said anything no probably no no uh no cheer teams and no music Right, no dancing girls, as he put it. That was his phrase. And lots of cigars. Yeah, 
Um, <laughs> and they want everybody wants to hear the sneakers squeaking on the court. So just keep it quiet in there. I said, well, Red, we'll we'll see. Uh, we got to, you know, we're at the time they were selling eleven thousand tickets in an eighteen thousand six hundred building. So uh, we added a little bit of music at least, and eventually brought a dance team in. I was actually hoping to ask this of Mark, but we lost him. But look, let me ask you. His players not long ago in the social justice movement refused to take the court. They saw a bigger issue other than basketball. That's a difficult position for the owner of a team. You are running a business and yet you must, I would think, side with your players in something they feel so strongly about. Again, this doesn't seem as if it's going away anytime soon that you know, players feel strongly about social issues. How do you balance being the owner of the team and what your players may want? Well, the uh, you're right. The Bucks did didn't take the court for that particular key game. And Mark, you were referenced in that question, but uh, we're talking about social justice. But yeah. I, Scott, I'd just like to say, first of all, all the teams and the owners stopped play. I mean, the players led that in the bubble, and I would not minimize their leadership on that issue but we stood unanimously with them on that. And so I'd really prefer to say, and the way I think of it myself anyway, not to tell you what to say, is that the players and owners and league shut down for three days in the bubble to consider what to do next. And with the leadership of the players, but with the support of everybody else I just mentioned, decided to continue so that the message would come out. We just had uh, you know, obviously another um, uh, moment uh, last week and uh, there were conversations before games I'm personally aware of, of whether or not teams would play. And ever since the summer, I've been trying to learn how much I've been missing about racism and wasn't willful, willfully ignorant, but had been quite ignorant. And I'm trying to remedy that with the help of players like Jalen Brown, who's helping me with that. And so we're all in this together. It's not just the players and we stand with them. Mark, same in your locker room? Mark, 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 do you have us? Yes, sorry. Okay, is it same in your locker room? Because it was your team that, I, that I led apologize that charge. For some, I don't know if you guys can hear me. I I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. I can hear Wick. I just can't hear Scott or Peter. Oh. They, they, just, right. they just asked. I'll be the interpreter here. Okay. Right. They, they just asked if it's the same in the Bucks locker room that you all stand together on these issues. Oh yeah, it's look. I think ultimately, at the end of the day, for all of us, um, we got very involved. Um, I mean, Wes and I, with the team in supporting what they were doing. Um, I I don't think there was any issue whatsoever, and we supported the players. Um, we've been supporting them. We've gone out there. Um, I've marched with the players. So I, I, I think we are all on board. So it hasn't been an issue whatsoever. They also asked if you were jealous, you know, of any of the Celtics success or you know, really secretly cheer for the Celtics. No, no. I grew up, I grew up in Hartford. So, um, you know, originally I was a Celtics fan. How, how could you not be? So, I'm just kidding, Mark. Yeah. But yeah. Thank you. But that's a good side of sports business lessons, though, in Hartford, when the Patriots uh, held a uh, press conference that they were moving there uh, on the Capitol steps. But uh, Mark and Wick, thanks so much. We're going to head down to Washington and uh, bring in Ted Leonsis uh, and get his take on all this. So thank you, gentlemen. We do appreciate it.